Hi, this is Tim Grage, Senior Pastor of the City of Zion, and welcome to another episode of Phronesis. It's been, if I'm not mistaken, six weeks of examining the work of faith. How has it been for you so far? If you are catching this at the tail end, you have missed such a phenomenal, life-changing teaching. But not to worry, it's right there on the YouTube channel for Nessus Africa. You need to watch it because if you have any area of your life where the enemy has created an incursion, any area of your life where there is a compromise, any area of your life where there seems to be an oppression of any sort, the issue there is the state of your faith. Notice my choice of words, not the quality of your faith, because the quality of your faith is a person. Your faith is a person. What is lapsing and what is amiss there is your ability to work that faith, your ability to work with Jesus. Because if Jesus is your faith and your faith is not working, it means that you have not learned how to activate and work with the faith you have been given. And so we have looked at quite a number of things. So far, we looked at the source of faith. We looked at the fact that faith is a person. We looked at why faith is important. We looked at the threefold cord that makes up faith. And that's where we are now. The threefold cord that makes up, uh, makes up faith is as follows. Faith sees something, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Faith says something, 2 Corinthians 4, 13. And then faith does. Uh, the last time we were together, we were looking at the fact that faith says something. Saints of God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 10, it says we should hold fast to our profession of faith. Let me give you an illustration. This is my iPad. If, if I'm holding it and then somebody says, hold it fast. Hold it fast is colloquial English for hold it tightly. It means that there is a perception or a concern that it might fall for whatever reason. So I'm being asked to hold it firmly. When the scripture there says, hold fast your profession of faith, it is basically saying that there are circumstances that are tempting to take your faith from you. When I say take your faith, Jesus can't be taken away from your heart. And so when we say take your faith from you, we're talking about taking the manifestation and the fruit of your faith uh, from your experience. He says the only way you can hold your, your experience to match your faith is by holding your confession, holding fast your profession. Saints, Circumstances will attempt to put words in your mouth. Pain in your body will attempt to put words in your mouth. When you check your bank account, it will attempt to put words in your mouth. When you check your email, it will attempt to put words in your mouth. Hope you understand what I mean by words in your mouth. That pain in your body will attempt to cause you to say, I'm in pain, it's getting worse. Now that letter that you received from your boss in your email that is negative will attempt to make you say it's getting worse. Uh, that, that family gathering where everybody is saying and reminding each other how this one lost a job and this one is on suspension and this one's business is no longer working will attempt to put words in your mouth. That news that you are watching, CNN, that is telling you how the COVID cases are this and that and that is attempting to put words in your mouth. So the Bible is saying, hold fast. Hold fast, meaning stay, be a stickler for your confession. Listen, when Abraham's name, oh, if you don't understand what I'm about to say, you, you need to watch the previous episodes because I really can't start going back to the beginning. But when Abraham's name was changed to Abraham, which meant father of many nations, even though he was barren, and Sarai's, Sarai's name was changed to Sarah, which means mother of many nations, you can imagine the snivelings and the bickerings and the gossiping around the water cooler in the office. <laughs> so Sarah shows up and says, um, um, it, it's, it's good to meet you, madam. Uh, what's your name? My name is Sarah. Are, are you wife of Abraham? You, you know why they're asking that. Because when you say Sarah, it means mother of nations. And go, um, are you the, 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 the Sarai uh, wife of Abraham, she goes, yes, I am. Oh, I, and your name is Sarah? Say, yes, my name is Sarah. You understand the mockery that was on the table. But guess what? She had no choice. It was her name. So even though she was unhappy with it, it was her name. So she had to say it. And then that's why it was her name that God changed. 
so that even if she was uncomfortable with it, because it was her name, she had to keep saying it. Because it was her name, she had to keep hearing it, even if it made her uncomfortable. Do you know how it would have made her uncomfortable? She herself, when the angel said she would have a child, she was crying. I mean, she was laughing because it didn't make sense. And then <laughs> Abraham comes and says, your name is now, is now mother of many nations. If I was Sarah, in today's day and age, she probably would have said to Abraham, you are trying to mock me, aren't you? It's not bad enough what I've been going through. Now, even you, a two brute, even you are trying to mock me. You are coming to tell me my name is now mother of many nations. But she accepted that and she kept on saying it. Saints, faith works with what you see and it works with what you say. As long as she did not care what people will say and she kept on saying it, within a year she conceived, a year following she gave birth to a child. Saints, what have you been saying? Don't let the circumstances give you words to say. You must stick. No matter what you are experiencing, you must stick to the word of God. How do you know that what you are saying is in faith? Two things. Number one, make sure it lines up with a scripture, with a promise, with a declaration concerning that issue that you have. It has to line up with the word of God. So if the, it has to line up with what the word has said concerning your health, if it's a health issue, concerning your child, concerning whatever. So as long as it lines up, it is likely a word of faith. And then number two, the litmus test is, is it speaking about something to come or something that has already happened? For example, are you still saying, I, have, I am believing God for my healing? That's not faith. You must be saying, I have been healed of this condition. I am healed of this condition. Faith speaks in the past tense. I am a billionaire. You know, when I say that and you start laughing, you go, from where? Hey, hey, billion what? From which maybe in Zim dollars. That is exactly, no offense to any Zimbabwean, no offense, okay? But that is exactly how Sarah would have felt. The ridiculousness of having to mention those words around people that knew that that was not her case and that was not her current experience. Saints, if you are too shy to be bold enough to say God's word, your life will be shy of experiencing its results. Did you hear me? You must be. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Ah, he says, for it is the power of God unto salvation. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. It is the power of God unto salvation. I'm not ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Say it. What are your expectations? Say it. Say it in the marketplace. Say it in school. Say it at the office. Say it at home. Say it to yourself. Say it to your spouse. Let them say, how is it going to happen? Say it. And you will have what you say. Ah, time flies when you're having fun. The third part, after you see and you say, is the fact that faith does. Faith sees, faith says, and then there is something called the deeds or the act of faith. Faith sees, faith says, and faith does. I'll give you the scripture, even though I will not be able to explain it, but it will give you clarity. James chapter 2 verse 17 says, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Maybe you should read it in the Amplified. Ah, you don't have Amplified? Not to worry, I have it here. Let me read it for you. It says, so also faith, if it does not have works, deeds and actions of obedience to back it up. By itself, it is destitute of power. In operative, it is dead. There are deeds that go with faith. Don't confuse this with Ephesians 2 verse 9. It is not you doing it to show you have faith. It is you doing it because you have faith. Oh, I will clarify it when we meet again soon. For this week though, keep saying, keep saying. This has been Tim Grange, Senior Pastor of the City of Zion of Catch you again on the final part. 
of the work of faith. Bye for now. Hello, I am Humphrey Osin, and I'm really glad to be here on this amazing broadcast. And I tell you, lives are being changed. Transformation is taking place. I've heard people call me and tell me that great things are happening in their lives. And I believe it will happen for you too. So don't miss this series. I'll tell you, this is really cutting edge. Now, we've been talking about the fact that Adam was a living soul. Adam did not have the spirit life. He didn't have a ruach. He didn't have pneuma. I used to think that for many years. Like, I just discovered some time back that, look, Adam is, is below the new believer or below Christ, who we really are. Now, we need to understand there is a difference between identity and personality. Your identity is in your spirit, while your personality talks of your soul, your name, your upbringing, your experiences, what you read, that talks of your personality. But your identity has to do with your nature, the part of you that came from God, the part of you you receive at the new birth, the spirit of Christ in you, that is your identity. And you know, Jesus Christ lived an exceptional life because he, he built his life from his identity. We need to learn to think from our identity. Jesus was always thinking from his identity. He was more focused, he was more identity conscious than personality conscious, and that's why miracles were a part of his life. And if you want miracles to be part of your life and you are a believer, you're born from above, you have to live from your identity. You have to pray from your identity. You have to do everything from your identity. That's why the Bible says that everything that we do in word and do it, deed, everything that we do in word and deed, do it from the name or do it in the name because the name of Jesus describes your identity. We have the same name. If they ask you what's your name, they're asking for identity. So your name and the name of Jesus is our identity and in his name. And in his name, the name of Jesus describes our identity and in his name, his name represents his authority, his nature of righteousness, his power and his glory. So Jesus Christ functioned from identity. Jesus Christ said he did everything in the name of the Father. Let me put it this way. Jesus was saying I did everything in the identity of the Father. So Jesus Christ lived from the identity of his father. So you never see Jesus Christ talking about, oh, Joseph, Mary, talking about his, his, being a capital son. The, when Jesus Christ asked Peter or his disciples, who do men say that I am? That's identity. What's my identity? How do men define me? Some say Elijah, some say great prophet and all that. Then he said, who do you say that I am? Do you know my identity? Have you discovered my identity? And what did Peter say? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Why, why was this important? What was Jesus' answer? He said, thou art blessed. You want to be blessed? Discover the identity of Christ. It's well the one in you. Thou art blessed, Simon bar Jonah, and your name, your identity, shall be called Peter. Hallelujah. And upon this rock, Upon this rock, I build my church. Now, what was Jesus Christ saying? That if you want to walk, live a solid life, an unstoppable life, you must discover the identity of Christ. The reason why the church is unstable, the church has been weak, we do not understand the difference between identity and personality. We don't know identity in Christ. And he said something, flesh and blood has not revealed this. Now, Paul also said something similar. He said that we knew Christ after the flesh. We knew him as a capital son. We knew him, Joseph was his father. We knew that part of Christ. But now we don't know him like that anymore. We now know him from revelation. That if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And all things are passed away. So Paul began to bring out something that has to do with revelation. Not the knowledge from the senses. Not what flesh and blood has revealed. So and it is upon this rock, upon revelation knowledge, upon the revelation of Christ. And in Paul, talking about the revelation of Christ, we don't know Christ as the flesh. He went straight into who we are. Hallelujah. So in order for the church to be strong, we must know Christ. And, and by knowing Christ, we now know who we are. We now know our identity. And it's upon this rock 
that I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. If the gates of hell have been prevailing, it's because the church have been working on in their personality and not working in their identity. You know, if they ask you who you are, they ask most Christians who they are, they'll begin to talk about probably their name, their humanity, the job they do, the character they have. How do you see somebody talk about his, what his identity? But when Jesus Christ was saying, who do men say that I am and who do you say that I am? He was happy because they knew his identity, not just his personality. And Jesus always said, Jesus always spoke about his identity. Jesus will say, I'm from above and you're from beneath. And he will say, he that is from above is above all. Dominion comes from knowing where you're from, your heavenly heritage. He that is from above, he that is born from above rules. He that is born from above is above all. So when you lean on your personality, you'll always struggle. When you lean on your personality, you'll always, you know, you'll always fail as a Christian. You, you'll struggle in prayer. You wonder why I pray, I don't seem to get answers. You'll wonder why you can't speak to a storm. Jesus Christ could speak to storms. Why? He's functioning from his identity. Jesus Christ could speak to a freak who will die. And he told them, you can do greater than this in Matthew 21, 21. He said, not only. Now listen to this. He said, if you have faith, if you know your identity, I won't put know your identity as faith. If you know your identity, if you have a revelation in your heart of your identity, you will not only command the fig tree to die, you'll also command the mountain. You'll do even much more. Jesus Christ told his disciples, if you know who you are, if you have faith in your righteousness, if you have faith in, the finished, in my finished work, you will not only tell the fig tree, but you'll also command mountains and they'll move. You'll do the impossible. You want to see the impossible in your business. You want to see your business flourish as a businessman, I, I, I remember when I spoke to a man, uh, he called me, his bakery had been working, no pro profit, nothing happening for months. He felt there was a principality. I began to share with him. I began to teach him of the presence of Christ, that he should develop a consciousness that Christ is in him and Christ is everywhere. And within three months, that business that had not been making any progress for months began to see a change began to see progress. They had to even hire more workers. Another businessman many years ago also came. He was in debt to millions, millions in debt. And I told him, know the covenant. I shared with him on covenant. And covenant reveals you a part of your identity. And from that time, he saw a change in his business. All the debts were, all the debts were paid. And supernatural wealth transfer came his way. Today he's flourishing. I tell you, when you understand who you are, you cannot go down. Our strength as believers comes from our identity, not from our personality. Your faith, your prayer life, your sense of dominion, your sense of mastery, your confidence that God always hears you comes from a knowledge of our identity. That's why Paul said that the mystery hidden from the foundation of the world is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're not just like Adam before the fall that just had the life, the soul life. We are like Jesus that was born from above, that has the spirit life, the spirit of God himself. That's why I, I love saying this a lot when, when I face challenges. That look, we have overcome them. I laugh at impossible situations because I know we have overcome them because greater is he. That's the spirit of Christ. That's the nature of God in us. That's the life of God. Greater is he that is in me, that's Jesus, than he that's in the world. So we can boldly say like Paul that in all these things we are more more, not just conquerors. Why? Because of the kind of life that we have. So we need to lean on identity. Jesus Christ always depends on his identity. So in the face of the storm, he'll say, stop. In the face of the impossible, miracles will come were the norm for Jesus because he knows who he is. God bless you and keep on living a life of victory. Welcome again to Francis. This is Dr. Julius uh, with you this, this day, and we want to really appreciate the time you've afforded us to come your way. Uh, we talked last time about redefining the leader in you, redefining the leader in you. We highlighted the fact that we are in a leadership crisis. If you talk church, if you talk government, if you talk business, we have a leadership crisis. It's a major one which we definitely cannot uh, by any way abscond responsibility, but assume that 
that responsibility on this show and make sure that we can clarify on redefining the leader in you. And so I've been talking on the topic, redefining the leader in you. And our first component we talked about was if you want to highlight leadership in terms of the L, E A D E R. The first key letter is a L, which is long term visionary. Uh, we're looking at a long term visionary. But the second component, which I want to discuss today, which is the second letter, is the E. And the E, a leader must be exemplary. A leader must be exemplary. And the key component there is integrity. Integrity is a very vital component of leadership, and we definitely shouldn't be oblivious to the fact that uh, the major crises that we face now are these within the church and within even our, our government circles is all about integrity. Uh, but I want to really focus much more on the church. Uh, I define integrity within the very component of integrity for me is a fear of God. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 8, verse 13, the fear of God is hatred of evil. And it is very important for us to realize that God wants men and women of integrity to take leadership and ownership of the very task and responsibility that he's entrusted us with. Uh, the Bible also says in Proverbs 2.21, Proverbs 2.21, it says, in the Revised Standard Version. For the upright will inhabit the land, and men of integrity will stay in the land. And let me give you a little bit of perspective on this verse and give it a little bit of explanation and interpretation. Many pastors will get into the ministry, but only pastors with integrity will stay in the ministry. Only men of God with integrity will stay in the ministry. And, and permit me to define integrity on two key components. One key component is financial integrity. Financial integrity is the propensity for you to be able to manage and be a proper steward of the finances or resources that God has entrusted you with. One of the biggest problems we are facing now in Christendom, especially around leadership, is financial integrity. A lot of leaders in the church are falling short of a clean financial slate. And I want to address it today because God expects us to really place high standards on our financial, financial management, on our finances. If ever people entrust us with money in church, we should be able to give them proper accountability. We should be able to give them proper transparency in the way we manage our finances. A lot of pastors have fallen short of financial integrity, but I want to touch a second part of being exemplary and integrity. The second component is emotional integrity. <laughs> Emotional integrity is the stability of your emotions as a man of God. I know what I'm talking today might be a little bit of a very tough and controversial point, but I want to say there is a need for us to understand. God meant us to have one wife, not two. We should be able to communicate this very frankly, but in love. I communicate this because I know some pastors are facing a lot of crisis, but we should be able to have God by the Holy Spirit enable us, but your willpower comes in, check your emotional imbalances. It's very vital for you to be exemplary because if ever your emotional life, your relational life with the opposite sex is not properly addressed, if you are not faithful to your wife, it might be a huge component that will affect your leadership. Many people invest in the leader before they invest in the ministry. Let me put it this way. Many people invest in the minister before they invest in the ministry. And great men of God have been victims in one way or the other, maybe vicariously by the exposure to emotional integrity. In the Bible, we see the case of David. There was a huge setback on his life because of emotional integrity. We see the case of Solomon. There was a huge setback in his life because of emotional integrity. But there's a good 
and positive example in the Bible, and that one is Joseph. Joseph was at a week of a big, big, big temptation at Potiphar's house by the wife of Potiphar, but he passed the test. And so my prayer is that if there is any pastor, any leader following me this day, uh, you might be going through an emotional, topsy-turvy, difficult situation. I've not come to condemn you. I've not come to judge you. If you've fallen, I believe God can restore you, but I've come to tell you, put safeguards around your emotional life because this is a topic which many do not want to touch, but I've come because it is time for us to salvage the leadership in the church. And I believe this is a platform which has given us to talk frankly, pastor to pastor, iron sharp net iron, one man must sharpen the other. We should be able to watch one another and make sure that we live exemplary lives as leaders. I leave you with a summary. We've talked already on two key points. The first we've talked about redefining the leader in you. The L is you as a leader, you must dig deep inside of you and look at the long-term vision that God is giving you for your people. But number two, we've said you must also live an exemplary life. And the key component of exam exemplary life we've talked about is integrity. Key component of integrity we've touched today is financial integrity. Make sure your hands are clean on the church finances. <laughs> But secondly, make sure also that you're a husband of one wife and that you really cherish your wife. Make sure that you live a life which is beyond reproach in your emotional life. So we want to thank you this day and say we will be coming your way again on Francis. This has been Dr. Julius. We pray God bless you, God inspire you, and God keep you strong to run this race. Thank you. Praise God. You've heard the word of God today and you're making a decision. I want my life to change. Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. He wants to come in. Pray this simple prayer with me today and Jesus Christ will come into your heart, save you and give you eternal life. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you. I open my heart and I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Lord Jesus, save me. Wash me in your blood. Give me eternal life. From today, I will serve you as you live in me. In Jesus' name. Well, congratulations. You've come into the kingdom of God. You're a new creation. We love you and we believe you'll grow in Christ and discover who you are as a child of God. God bless you.